All right, all right, my friends, welcome back to All Cars. It is time for another Motor Week Retro Review Reaction. This week it is the 86 On-Road 4x4 Comparo. So, of course, as always, I am John, and I decided this would be an interesting one, simply because, if I understand the description correctly, they're going to look at, like, a, a van wagon and a, a Civic 4x4. I thought it might be a little change of pace from the boring sedans I've been doing recently, and... Hey, you know what? I'm kind of curious to see what the vehicles are and, and reminisce a little bit with you on these. I did also just note this thing is almost 26 minutes long. So I may cut my, my commentary down a little bit and maybe edit it for length just to keep this reasonable. But as always, I appreciate you being here, spending a little bit of time reminiscing with me. Grab your beverage of choice. Sit in a comfy chair and let's take that trip down memory lane. Your host for Motor Week, John Davis. Well, hello and welcome again to Motor Week. We have a very special edition of Motor Week this time. We're going to take a look at four-wheel drive vehicles, ones that are made to be used on the street. Four-wheel drive equipped cars, vans, and station wagons are a growing phenomenon. And a lot of people are asking us if they should check off the four-wheel drive block on their new car order form. We hope to help answer that. So we've collected five very different four-wheel drive models, and we're going to explain the pros, the cons, and the purpose of each. Pat Goss will be along, too, to explain the special maintenance needs for on-road four-wheel drive vehicles. So, let's get to the cars. So, generally speaking, when they're talking about this being on-road, I don't like them using the term 4x4. Four four. To me, that's all-wheel drive. 4x4 four four is when you have more of an off-road focus and a low-range gearing. Although they did muddy the waters when they started offering full-time four-wheel drive that also had a low range. But I don't think these are going to be off-roady type cars. I think they're just all-wheel drive. It's a little thing, but when I do have OCD, it kicks in on things like that. Now, our first subject is the latest newcomer to a growing list of cars offering four-wheel drive. It's the Mercury Topaz all-wheel drive. As you might have guessed, the Ford Tempo also offers this four-wheel drive system. But whether you opt for the Ford or the Mercury, the idea is the same. Improve traction and safety in bad weather. At first glance, the Mercury Topaz all-wheel drive looks like any other Topaz. Mercury decided that rather than build a special model with all sorts of unnecessary extras, it would make four-wheel drive a simple add-on option. The only external feature that distinguishes our test car from any other Topaz is a small badge on the trunk lid. You have to look under the car to see the real difference. What you'll first notice is a two-piece drive shaft like those on most rear drive cars. Throw a vacuum actuated dash switch and a sliding clutch collar arrangement in the front transfer case links the automatic transmission with the drive shaft. Power is then transmitted to a limited slip differential that turns the rear wheels. This system's power transfer gearing looks simple for a modern four-wheel drive, but we're told it was very difficult to engineer. It can be actuated at any speed or even when the car is standing still. Ford's designers are careful to stress that the system is for dirt roads or pavement and bad weather only. Unfortunately, we were cursed with good weather for the whole time we had the Topaz and an earlier four-wheel drive tempo. So we looked for the wettest cow paths we could find. Our little rutted road, John, showed the system to have excellent traction with no change in the car's normal docile handling. As you might expect, four-wheel drive requires more power than you get from a standard Topaz. Ford solved this by making the 2.3-liter high-output engine part of the all-wheel drive package. You know, I, I, I don't love this car. I don't hate it. I think I've shared memories uh, about the Topaz and the Tempo before. Um, honestly... Even though I knew it, I tend to forget that these had an all-wheel drive system. Um, and not making it uh, capable of, of being used on dry pavement in a full-time way, I don't know. I see why Ford did away with it. I imagine their sales on this were tiny. But don't you get that feeling that Ford missed that opportunity to be like Subaru, but bigger. 
That's my overwhelming feeling here because why do you need this on this car? You know, it's if it's not used on dry pavement, it's not a performance thing. It's just adding weight. It's adding complexity. It's probably hurting the gas mileage slightly. Hopefully they'll mention it. Maybe you're, you, you are a person who can only afford a topaz, but you need to go to your lake house. I don't know. I don't know. This one never, this doesn't make any sense to me. This four-cylinder engine puts out 100 horsepower and 125 pound-feet of torque. Track performance is typical family car with a 0 to 60 time of 14.9 seconds. The quarter mile ended in 19.7 seconds at 69 miles per hour. Power runs through a smooth shifting three-speed automatic transmission. This is the only transmission available with all-wheel drive. Our slalom handling test also brought no surprises. The Topaz has always been a stable car with good road grip and excellent steering feel. Body roll is moderate. The four-wheel independent suspension maintains a good balance between performance and ride comfort. Braking is equally competent with an average stopping distance of 115 feet from 55 miles per hour. Our test car came in top line. Before they go on, that that's okay. I mean, that's kind of slow, and the high output engine gives 100. Um, but, you know, uh, six years later, the base engine on a Saturn provided 85. So that's not actually terrible. Let's, let's be fair about it. And I want to like the Tempo and the Topaz. I, I really do. I think it's a unbelievably generic car. My problem is, and I, I think it's because of how they do the front bumpers darker, it always looks very narrow and tall to me. Like, the proportions are just a little weird. It doesn't, it doesn't look wide and stable, even though it is. It just looks kind of awkward and unbelievably generic. Not ugly. LS trim. That means a plush roomy interior that compares favorably with more expensive Mercury's. The seats are comfortable and supportive with an optional six-way power adjustment for the driver's seat. The dash is well designed with plenty of ventilation and all controls in easy reach. Topaz gauges include a clear tack but no readouts for oil pressure or volts. Other features include standard intermittent wipers, comprehensive climate controls, and this optional cassette stereo. The all-wheel drive system is... You know, on the interior there, it's always funny to me. You know, I modern cars typically have the windshield wipers on a stock. And it's always funny to me to see older cars where it's going to be... Inter where are we going to put it? I don't know. Let's. How about here, in the middle of the dash? We could, instead of a clock, why don't we put the wipers there? It's always been a little funny to me. Overall, it's not a bad interior. I really don't like the color of the dash. I'm, that That's nitpicking. But the thin strip of fake wood they put around the instrument binnacle there, I, I know it's a mercury, so I guess they were trying to spruce it up a little bit. It, it feels a little silly, but I actually didn't think it was that ugly. Is $915 extra on any Topaz, including the base GS and performance trimmed GS Sport. The luxury LS grade four door starts at only $10,783, and our car optioned out to $12,932. Its sister all wheel drive Ford Tempo begins at $10,194. Modestly priced models for such traction flexibility. So Ford has taken an already popular family car and added the one thing that was missing the ability to get around under any road or weather conditions. Other options may offer comfort or convenience, but this is the one that really delivers peace of mind. Now there are many different kinds of four-wheel drive systems. Some only work part-time or on demand. The system on the Topaz is a good example of that. But other systems can be used to send power to all four wheels all the time. Such systems are known as full-time four-wheel drive. Now, Subaru is one of the leading sellers of on-road four-wheel drive, and they've been getting along with an on-demand system for years. Well, now they've introduced a full-time system, and we tried it on their Highline GL10. 
The four-wheel drive Subaru GL10 Turbo is a car that tries to be all things to all drivers. A high-performance car, a family car, a luxury car, and a foul-weather car. And for that, you pay a hefty price, $15,744. As for the full Hold on, hold on. Okay, so first off, let's talk about the styling real quick. Um, I dig... Subarus. I really do. I don't know if I'll ever own one in my life. And and part of it is because Subaru owners are very cultish. <laughs> you know, once they have one, they're like, oh, you need to have one. And once you have one, you're gonna want more. You know, they're they're like that. Okay. Um, I've driven them, I've driven uh, legacies, I've driven uh, you know, um Impreza's, I've driven, uh, you know, two, yeah, the Outback, and then the, what is the other one, the smaller one? Um, I've always liked them, but never enough to say, I'd rather have this than a Honda. This was such a dorky car, I really liked it. I mean, uh, it, it looks like a, a, a Nissan and a Toyota had a love child that had really long legs because it always looks like it's really high with a lot of space underneath it, but then the, it's not overly beautiful. It's just a cool, it's so dorky, I love it. But consider, <laughs> this thing is $5,000 more than the Mercury. Now, granted, it has full-time four-wheel drive, which instantly makes me think the American manufacturers are once again behind the eight ball here. Everybody's out innovating them. But it's 50% more money, basically. I, this, that's really, really shocking. Time four-wheel drive, you can order it in any Subaru sedan or a three-door coupe. Although the system is engaged all the time, there's also a locking center differential that's meant for use only on the most slippery surfaces. Subaru claims the full-time system improves the car's handling and performance. The theory is, since power goes to all four wheels all the time, there's no power loss to wheel spin on full throttle starts. Well, acceleration is brisk in the GL10. Our car went from 0 to 60 in 10.3 seconds and ran the quarter mile in 17.6 seconds at 78. The theory seems to work since the all-time four-wheel drive GL10 was slightly faster than the last part-time four-wheel drive GL10 we tried. But some credit should also go to the engine. Horsepower is up slightly over last year for the 1.8 liter turbocharged flat four. It's now rated at 115 horsepower and 134 pound-feet of torque. Maybe so, at the So consider that. For 15 extra horsepower, this thing was about four, almost five seconds faster, zero to 60. That, that's really impressive, actually. That's really surprising. Engine had twice the power, the GL10's full-time system might have shown more of an acceleration advantage. We also couldn't see that much of an advantage to the new system in handling. The GL10 is only as competent as before, and it still has the same flaw a power steering pump that won't deliver power to the steering in quick turns. As for quick stops, the GL10 is good. Its brakes are easy to modulate, fade is minimal, and our stopping distances were good, averaging 115 feet from 55. The only thing to complain about here is too much nose dive. Most drivers will be more impressed with the GL10's luxury. The suede look upholstery is new this year. The seats have supportive bolsters, and the driver's side is height adjustable and has an adjustable lumbar support. The rear seat is comfortable for two average-sized adults, and shoulder belts are supplied. The GL10's digital instrumentation is revised this year, and many of the driver controls have also been altered. We approve of most of the changes, but there are still no readouts for oil pressure or volts. There is a four-wheel drive indicator. A switch on the console controls the ride height for when the snow gets really deep. The GL10's pneumatic suspension will also level itself to compensate for loads. And for those loads, the GL10 has plenty of trunk space for most sedan-type chores. Plus a rear seat back with flat folding inserts for carrying long items. The Subaru GL10 Turbo is a very versatile car that performs almost all its advertised functions fairly well. As for its full-time four-wheel drive system, while it may not improve its high-performance image that much, it's always there when you need it in bad weather, and that's what's most important.
really that's what was really interesting um you know they started at the beginning about oh subaru's trying to be all things to all people and i didn't really buy that but the more i watched the more i alternately really liked this car and didn't understand what the market is you know it's it's relatively fast with a relatively small turbo four full-time all-wheel drive, but the ability to go in deeper snow, adjustable ride height, but not terribly sporting, competent handling, but the power steering pump can't keep up with quick changes. That tells you the car's not a sports sedan. The dash wasn't luxurious, but seems to be well-equipped, but then they throw in a digital dash, so it's not practical. They're going for the more you know, ritzy, ritzy, look at us. And then good backspace, but the rear seats fold down like any other practical sedan with a nice size trunk. I, I alternately love this car and cannot figure out who it was built for. Because if you pick a target, it's not good enough to be one of the best. If you pick the Accord and the Camry and compare this, I think the Accord and the Camry or even the old Stanza would be better. Well, if you pick a sports sedan, well, it, it doesn't do that real well either. It, it's what an interesting car. I found this one very fascinating. A uh, good performer that I, I can't figure out why anybody would buy it. You know, anytime you have a car with special equipment, it's going to need some special maintenance. Four-wheel drive is no exception. So Pat Goss is here now with some thoughts on how to maintain on-road four-wheel drive. Pat? Thanks, Pat. Now, suppose you want a four-wheel drive vehicle for improved foul weather traction, but let's also suppose that you don't want to be bothered with pushing any buttons or pulling any handles to engage the system. Well, some manufacturers are coming out with completely automatic four-wheel drive systems. They work without any help from the driver. Volkswagen is one of them, and they call their offering the Vanagon Synchro. The Volkswagen Vanagon Synchro hardly looks different from any other Vanagon. External changes are limited to larger tires and an extra inch of ground clearance. The Synchro system works by automatically transferring power between the front and rear axles. That's done by a revolutionary viscous fluid coupling device, which measures wheel slip and sends power to the front wheels when they start losing traction. The viscous coupling is a sealed unit, and Volkswagen claims the four-wheel drive synchro needs no more maintenance than the standard rear drive Vanagon. If you live where there is really extreme weather, you can order an optional driver-operated locking differential in the rear. This keeps both rear wheels turning at the same speed for additional traction. The synchro's power comes from a new 2.1-liter fuel-injected four-cylinder that's standard on all Vanagons. This engine produces 95 horsepower and 117 pound-feet of torque. That's a healthy boost over last year's 1.9-liter engine. Despite the improvements, though, accessibility for service is still a chore because of the underfloor rear engine bay. Even with the new engine, the van... Before they go on, I've always been fascinated with this van. Um, the fact that you've got... Uh, what amounts to a cab over with a short wheelbase it's square it's boxy it's it's a bread van when america was coming out with the caravan and then the later copiers to it um that being said uh being somewhat of a volkswagen fan i've always been f fascinated is the word with this vehicle and its its later iterations um Partially because I think it makes no sense whatsoever. And that kind of appeals to me. You know, in, in almost every way, a caravan would be more practical than this thing. But look at it, you know. And I can't wait to see how slow it is here in a second with 95 horsepower. But then they're like, hey, let's put all-wheel drive on it. And, you know, a revolutionary viscous coupling. Um... Really, really interesting. Vanagon isn't going to win any awards for speed. Zero to 60 took 16.5 seconds. 
and the quarter mile ended in 20.9 seconds at 67 miles per hour. All right, I'm going to interrupt again because I'm going to go ahead and tell you that over 16 seconds, that's slow. And now all of you who like to comment below that I'm comparing it to modern cars can go ahead and do so. The standard four-speed manual transmission has a rough, notchy feel that makes quick shifting a problem. Synchro-equipped vehicles get an extra low gear for tough terrain, but if you want the synchro, you can't get an automatic. Braking fared much better with 115-foot stops from 55. All stops were straight, and the firm pedal made modulation easy. That, that's a fantastic result. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's at 55, but for a, a, this van, for this vehicle, with this weight, with this much... Of a mass up high, stopping at 115, which is what the the Mercury and the the Subaru both did. That's really fantastic, actually. In handling tests, the Synchro tended to throw its tail out in tight turns, but the fine power steering made recovery easy. The interior is what we've come to expect from Volkswagen: handsome but Spartan, with firm adjustable seats and a functional, well-designed dash. Passenger room is generous with easy entry and lots of head and leg room. While the cargo floor is anything but flat, you can carry broad and long items by folding the seats into their bed position. Of course, all this versatility doesn't come cheap. The GL Synchro has a base price of $16,905. An optioned our test vehicle cost a hefty $19,935. So compared to other Volkswagen Vanagons, the Synchro isn't roomier, more comfortable, or even better looking. But it can go places a regular Vanagon can't, and it does so without any extra effort from the driver. Now, if you like the idea of having four-wheel drive and the idea of not having to think about it, but the Vanagon's too big for your needs, there is another alternative. The Honda Civic Wagon with what they call real-time four-wheel drive. Now, while Honda introduced a part-time four-wheel drive Civic Wagon two years ago, the new model uses a full-time system whose automatic technology is basically the same as on the Vanagon. We don't really know what real-time means, but it does work as well as any full-time driver-engaged four-wheel drive system. Owners will think it's even better after they feel the system transferring power to the proper wheels all on its own. And we don't think Honda could have picked a better package to endow than the Civic Wagon. As we noted when we last tested the front-wheel drive Civic Wagon, there's room for five adults inside. The seats have good lower back support, but they're a bit too flat and overly firm. And if you want to carry something other than passengers, the Civic Wagon will oblige with a... Okay, so they're kind of running through it pretty quickly. Um, I'm a Honda fan. I tell you that all the time here. I have one in the driveway right now. And uh, I like the Civic, but I do not like the wagon. I don't. I, I Honda does not style good wagons. Uh, this is a microvan. This is a anything else, but it, it doesn't strike me as wagon. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't love it, but I also do love it because all of what makes it ugly makes it so unbelievably useful let's let's see what else they say wide flat cargo floor a hatch that extends clear down to bumper height and double folding seats that allow 10 different cargo and people carrying configurations other interior amenities include a dash with very well placed controls and honda's traditional instrument pod with a big if incomplete set of gauges plus there's storage space everywhere even under the front seats. And while the two-wheel drive Civic Wagon has this nifty storage area above the spare tire, the four-wheel drive Civic Wagon has only a hard floor. The added four-wheel drive running gear takes up the extra space. And the spare tire gets a new home too, under the car on the 4x4. And the standard Civic's beam axle is replaced by a live one. We're sorry to say there's no limited slip differential. That means you'll need to keep three wheels planted at all times. So even though there's some extra ground clearance here, don't try to go too far off-road. The four-wheel drive Civic Wagon is powered by Honda's trusty 1.5-liter four-cylinder. It makes 72 horsepower and 83 pound-feet of torque. It comes mounted to a six-speed manual transmission. The extra gear is a super-low hill-pulling first. 
the shifter seems to give up some precision for the extra gear. An automatic is not available. And when we put the four-wheel drive Civic Wagon into action, we found an advantage to its drive system that conventional part-time systems don't have. The Civic Wagon won't spin its front wheels off the starting line. When the viscous coupling drivetrain senses the spinning wheels, it then sends power to the rear wheels. Unfortunately, that doesn't make the four-wheel drive Civic Wagon any faster. Our car took 16.1 seconds to reach 60 miles per hour, two seconds slower than the last two-wheel drive Civic Wagon we tested and darn close to the Volkswagen. That's really slow. But it is, what, what is that, 20 horsepower down? Um, even though it should be lighter uh, and a smaller package, that's, that's pretty slow. That's funny. We attribute the difference to the four-wheel drive car's extra 250 pounds of weight. But that didn't hurt its braking. For our car, stops took an average of 123 feet from 55. Not bad and they were well behaved all around. As for handling the four-wheel drive Civic is slower to respond to driver inputs than the standard wagon, and there's more body roll. If not exciting, the four-wheel drive Civic is competent. Base price for the Honda Civic 4x4 wagon is $10,104, $1,400 more than the two-wheel drive wagon. It may not be the most attractive four-wheel drive vehicle going, but the Honda Civic wagon could be one of the most efficient all-around packages and its automatic viscous coupling four-wheel drive is definitely the wave of the future. Th that's another one. I, 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 I struggle to find the purpose for that car. I mean, all of the attributes that make it good are just Civic Wagon. By adding the four-wheel drive, you can't use it all the time. When are you going to need it to go off-road? Are you using it on your farm? Or, again, do you have a lake house and you've got a long gravel road where you probably don't need four-wheel drive to begin with, but you can only afford a Civic? I don't understand the purpose of that car. It's cool, but slow, and I, I just, I don't get it. I really don't. I do like the interior, though. Now, your car may not have the latest four-wheel drive system, but maybe you like it just the same. If you do have a car that you think special, we'd like to see it and maybe even share it with everyone. Send us a good color photograph and a description to Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Who knows, maybe we'll make your car a star. Okay, now it's time to get back to four-wheel drive. When you think about full-time four-wheel drive and high performance, only one name comes to mind, Audi. And there's more to the now famous Quattros and just improved foul weather traction. The Audi four-wheel drive system also improves overall performance and handling. And Quattro also means something more, luxury, especially where Audi's flagship, the 5000 CS Quattro is concerned. Unlike the other vehicles we've looked at, this luxury touring sedan is the only one that gains a serious performance advantage from its full-time four-wheel drive. Traction is so superior to the front drive 5000S that the tires barely chirp when launched from a standing start, and acceleration is smooth and fast. Zero to 60 takes only 9.5 seconds, and the quarter mile flashes by in 16.5 seconds at 84 miles per hour. But the four-wheel drive difference really shows at handling limits. The Quattro is extremely stable for such a large car and swings easily through turns. In hard corners, you can still accelerate smoothly, something that's difficult to do in some front-drive cars. The firm steering reacts better for wide, fast curves than slower, tighter slaloms. But the four-wheel independent suspension does a good job of containing body roll. In accident avoidance maneuvers, the 5000's sheer size might overwhelm the chassis, but the Quattro's extra traction succeeds in letting the driver maintain confident control. In addition to the regular full-time four-wheel drive, all Quattro's have a dash control that locks the midship and aft differentials. You lock the center differential for driving on roads slick from rain, snow, or ice. The rear unit is only locked in extreme conditions like deep snow, sand, or mud. The Quattro can move as long as one wheel has traction. Many other four-wheel drive systems must have traction to at least two wheels in the same conditions. For braking, the Quattro gets four-wheel anti-lock disc brakes, which haul the car down from 55 with a distance average of only 110 feet on dry pavement. 
but the anti-lock brake system can be turned off. The theory is that the car will actually stop shorter without anti-lock in deep snow or sand. Also, when the center or aft differentials are engaged, the anti-lock braking system is automatically canceled. When each wheel is no longer rotating independently of the others, the system cannot function properly. That means you don't have the anti-lock action in those situations where you might need it the most, an engineering problem that is no doubt getting much attention. Not surprising, the Audi is going to be the most expensive, uh, extremely experienced with uh, all-wheel drive and more of a performance uh, approach, and not surprising, it's doing the best. Uh, best 0-60 to 60 and best stopping, and I've already done a reaction video to the Audi, so I'm not going to say too much about it, but them going into that detail about the analog brakes can be turned off if you're on gravel or snow, something like that. That's really good because I think people have largely forgotten that and our cars are so dumbed down, we don't even have the option anymore. But then also, if you have the differentials locked, it turns off the anti-lock braking system. Really interesting. Um, as they say, an engineering problem maybe Audi needed to work through but that's that's really interesting. You're driving in conditions where you feel you need well, you need the advantage of locking the diffs and then you don't have your anti-lock brakes. That's that's really interesting. That's a that is a very, very good observation, and I don't think I've ever heard that anywhere before. Power for all this hardware comes from a turbocharged intercooled five cylinder that displaces 2.2 liters. This superb power plant puts out 158 horsepower and 166 pound-feet of torque. The turbo's life is enhanced by water cooling. The coolant continues to circulate even after the engine is off. And the Quattro's inside easily lives up to the promise of the outside. The interior is pure luxury, with every 5000 series option except heated seats included as standard equipment. The leather-covered seats are firm and supportive, but lack side bolsters needed for serious driving. The leather-covered door panels include power windows, door and mirror controls, and two of the ten stereo speakers. The stereo itself is in the center dash below the automatic climate control. Above and to the left is a multifunction trip computer. The instrument cluster includes a center digital readout for engine functions not covered by the large analog gauges. The only available transmission is a slick shifting five speed manual. And topping off the 5000 CS Turbo Quattro is a tilt retracting power sunroof and a huge trunk with a very low sill. The trunk also has Audi's unique through the seat ski bag. You can carry long thin items without sacrificing much of the car's roomy seating ability. The Quattro's highway ride is expectedly firm, but not harsh. You know when you hit a bump, but the suspension forgets it quickly. Notable noise is limited to the engine, which is louder than those in most other upmarket European sedans. And all of this Quattro's luxury, performance, and traction doesn't come cheap. The 5000 CS Quattro will set you back over $31,000. Now that's an awful lot of money. But in the world of on-road four-wheel drive, the Audi 5000 CS Quattro is the only one that offers serious drivers everything they should desire in a four-door sedan. As you've seen, on-road four-wheel drive covers a broad spectrum of designs, from the part-time system in the Mercury Topaz to the full-time Subaru GL10 Turbo. Systems can be strictly utility-oriented, like the Volkswagen Vanagon Synchro or the Honda Civic Wagon or they can be for higher performance, like the Audi 5000 CS Quattro. But the question remains, is on-road four-wheel drive for you? Well, if you can't remember how many times last winter you had a slick road scare or were stuck in the snow, then you don't need it. A good front drive car probably suits you fine. But if bad weather makes you afraid to leave home, then on-road four-wheel drive is something you should consider. There's one more thing to remember. These systems are not meant for going very far off-road. A gravel or dirt road through the woods is okay, but not for forging rivers or climbing stumps. We hope we've helped you decide, and we'll see you next time on Motor Week. That was really interesting. What a nice variety. That's a nice change from what we normally do on these reaction videos. Uh, the Audi's the only one I really loved um, compared to the rest of them. And 
I will back up what I said in two different places. I think about this this car just doesn't make any sense to me. I recognize that comes from somebody who lives in the South where there's only like two days a year where it doesn't at least break freezing, right? We don't have a lot of snow days that we have to be worried about. So I was thinking about this in terms of driving through the woods, driving down gravel roads, you know, across fields. Why would you need this in your grocery getter? I retract that for those of you who live in the frozen north. I understand. I don't have much more to add. Uh, I think of all of these, well, I like the Audi the best, but I have to say it's the Subaru, probably. I, I think its uh, all-wheel drive system is better than the Topaz's. Um, and it's just kind of a dorky, weird car. The van again, absolutely, no, that doesn't make any sense to me. And, and I don't, eh, I think there's better options out there. And the Civic it doesn't really quite do it for me. I'd rather have a sedan than that thing. I don't know. I don't know. Tell me what your favorites are below, guys, and I appreciate you being here.